Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry about that. No trouble at all. No trouble at all. It's good to finally be able to put a put a face to the person I've been speaking to for so long. Yeah. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself? I'm very well. Thank you. Uh I was just telling our folks who have joined us today about the conversation that we're going to be having. And so this is Robert Blunt. Um he's the president of Abe Ministries and I was hoping you could before we get started or rather you could start us off by telling us a little bit about Abe Ministries, what y'all do, so on and so forth. Well, Abraham Ministries is a uh a 40 year plus old prison ministry primarily um the cornerstone of what we do is we go inside the prisons throughout the state of Florida we share the gospel share a message of hope inside the prisons but then it's critical that we also um complement that message of hope with tangible opportunities for men and women returning to the community to live out their freedom in society and so we do that by providing um a vast array of comprehensive reentry services Can you tell us more about that? So, um men and women, returning citizens coming back into the community, um you know, housing is imperative. Um every time I've spoken with someone getting ready to come back to the community, I mean, that's number one priority where I'm going to live. So, we help mm-hmm. people um get housing to get stable, and then we have a uh nationally acclaimed um uh, comprehensive ready for work programs called ready for work hillsboro actually um we replicated this program through a partnership with an organization out of jacksonville uh called operation new hope and so um through this program uh we provide career development training uh job placement assistance case management uh we work with individuals um who perhaps are struggling with substance abuse or maybe a you know have some uh mental health challenges that they're seeking to overcome so all of our clients are assessed um we will prepare a plan of care for each one of them and then we work with them to achieve the short term and long term goals that they have amazing thank you so much for sharing that um i was just sharing with our audience before you came on that um incarcerated humans uh prison reform so on and so forth um reinstatement back into society and all things that we necessarily commonly talk about at community Tampa Bay and so i'm making a speculated guess that you know any such information would be very useful for both myself and everybody watching so i was wondering if you could share um what the impacts of incarceration are not just on those humans who are in- individuals who are incarcerated but also on their families well um First of all, our country uh has become the number one incarcerator in the world, right? Even though we um, you know, make up uh, a small part of the world's population, we have the largest population of of those who are incarcerated. Um so we have um you know, really created this this monstrous system, criminal justice system, uh if you will. And so with so many people incarcerated obviously um that just you know creates a ripple effect in the community mm-hmm. with broken families with children who have incarcerated parents um obviously with uh individuals returning back to the community and getting to a place where they can provide for themselves and become um self-sufficient as well so there's really this sort of um you know vicious cycle of incarceration because our recidivism rate is so high um two out of three people the national recidivism rate two out of three people will get out and go back um but then you also have this vicious generational cycle of children of incarcerated parents um becoming incarcerated themselves because when you think about it um just a quick story just to kind of put it in perspective I've yes, gone to a lot, a lot of probation offices with with clients um and you sit in a probation office and uh you look around the room and you see a lot of young children right um I know you know my son is is 17 but when he was that age you know I couldn't touch the doorknob without him asking hey dad where are we going um so you know how do you answer that question when you head it to a probation office and you know that young kid says hey mom dad where are we going mm-hmm. right um so we're going to see you know my probation officer oh okay well maybe when i grow up 
I'll have a probation officer too, you know. So when you just, yeah. you know, just think about the subtleties of life um, that these this population encounters, um, you just kind of grow up with this being the norm, and it really shouldn't be the norm. And so, you know, when you combine that with all of the challenges that these families face, plus, you know, okay, well, this must just be my norm, um, you have this whole generational cycle of even the children of incarcerated uh, individuals becoming incarcerated themselves. So, I mean, it, it, it's a huge challenge um, for us to, to overcome. And I just feel like, you know, there are some ways that um, this system has evolved that, that aren't particularly healthy. Do you think that the system needs to be reformed for us to prevent many of these challenges from recurring? Or do you I think do. that society needs to reform to make that happen? Or is it simultaneous? What is your opinion on that? I, I think it's simultaneous. I think it's both, right? Um, I think from a system standpoint, um, you know, we have, um, we have criminalized bad behavior, right? Things that perhaps um, you're probably younger than me. I'm just an old guy, but things that probably my generation did that was just, you know, mischief, mischievous. And, you know, in the youth of our folly, now you go to jail and get arrested for, you know? Right. Um, right. And not only that, I think we've also politicized um, incarceration and we have sort of focused in on um, the punitive punishment piece uh, versus, um, you know, more of the corrective action um, and wanting to redirect individuals. So, um, you know, you take that and combine it with, um, you know, not necessarily having, um, consistently having in, in most communities um, comprehensive reentry services, you know, you've kind of just created this whole, you know, vicious wheel, if you will. And so that's kind of the, the, the criminal justice piece. And, you know, when, when you look at it all the way back to convict leasing, you know, we have, we didn't just get here overnight. We strategically led this country to this place. And it's a very expensive proposition. Um, even here in the state of Florida, I mean, Governor DeSantis, when he gets to the budget this year, I mean, he's going to be looking at $2.6 billion just for our Florida's Department of Corrections alone in that budget. $2.6 billion to incarcerate 100,000 people in the state of Florida. That's a very expensive proposition, right? So, right. you know, from the system itself, um, I think that needs to be reformed. Um, but the second part of your question is um, the, the social and community side, because, again, if, if, if I'm coming out of prison and I need a place to live, um, one, I need a job, right? Two, um, if I can't get my name on a lease because I am an ex-felon or ex-convict, or if I have to pay twice as much as the other person because I'm coming out of prison and so now it's no longer affordable, then, you know, how am I supposed to sustain myself? Um, in that situation. And so from a society standpoint, you know, we have to be prepared not only with services to get people stable, but even once they find a job and stay on that job, you know, um, opportunities for them to live independently uh, in society as well and provide for not only themselves, but also um, provide for uh, their families as well. Heard, heard. Um, we have a question. Um, can you clarify what convict leasing is? So, um, I mean, if you think about uh, the transition from out of slavery, right? Um, when slavery was abolished, um, and you think about um, the 14th Amendment or 13th Amendment, um, basically the only way that slavery is legal, if you go back and read, uh, or if you saw Netflix's 13, I think it was called, um, mm -hmm. that slavery is legal, it's still legal to this day if you have been committed or convicted of a crime, right? And so when you talk about convict leasing, um, there are numerous contracts even today where um, prison labor is hired at a significantly discounted rate in order to do various jobs. 
um, whether that's telemarketing jobs, um, whether that's road work, they have road crews, um, they get hired out. I mean, essentially that's convict leasing. I mean, there's a contract between the prisons and some entity to pay for this labor. And they get that labor obviously at a discount. Right. And we know that disproportionately a significant number of people who are incarcerated are from black and brown communities. True. Very true. Um, are most of the people that you, um, that you provide services for from minority communities? Um, I'm probably... not going to say most. I mean, there's probably a 60-40 that we see. Okay. Um, right. And that could be a factor of many different things. I don't want to make any assumptions. But I would say right. for us, what we have seen, um, you know, at least since we launched the Ready for Work Hillsboro program in 2014, um, there's probably been about a 60-40 split there. Heard, heard. I want to go back to something that you said earlier about, um, you know, folly of youth, right? And young humans doing what young humans do and being mischievous. And instead of uh, simply being course corrected, um, being disciplined, but being disciplined through a larger system that then finds, um, ends up with them being in the criminal justice system. Right. Yeah. So I see it with, with the work that we do. We also work with a lot of young humans who, you know, uh, are either in the juvenile justice system or in some other sort of probationary system. And I'm so sorry, I have a dog. Please hold on. Just a second. It's it's all good. This is the thing with working at home, uh, working from home. Um, but like I was saying um, before that happened, this is where. Um, for a lot of our young humans, they also go, we've, we've directly worked with young humans who have gone through the system and have high levels of trauma also that have come from that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when we talk to them, they're just regular kids who followed some other older kids, um, you know, advice on doing something or were just in it for the fun of it or for the thrill of it. And now their lives have completely changed. Mm -hmm. Right. The trajectory of their lives have completely changed. So in that idea of the system, what are some of the things that in the work that you do yourself, the things that you've witnessed, what are some of the things that you would like to see changed if that was an option in our criminal justice system? Well, one of the things um, we actually worked on feverishly here in Hillsborough County, and that was a program called the Civil Citation Program. So this was um, a situation where you know, young kids, middle school, high school, um, let's say they could have a fight at school and technically they could be arrested, I mean, for for battery, you know. Um, I mean, we fought. We didn't go to jail. You know, you got up right, and same. shook hands and walked away, right? Um, but again, just going back to certain behaviors, um, it, it was not out of the question for uh, individuals to get arrested. Another example might be a petty theft situation, you know, that perhaps could, you know, be, um, you know, taken care of and addressed through a different vein versus resulting in an arrest. And now once this young person has this arrest on their system, I mean, on their record, you know, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. And of course, you know, when you get 18, your record is expunged. Those things are true to a certain degree, but law enforcement can see a lot of things that we can't see. So, right. um, you know, there was uh, a movement to take a pilot, a piloted program, a program that had been piloted, civil citation in some communities, and make it um, countywide so that when these first time offenses occurred, um, the uh, school resource officer or the officer on site could issue this civil citation which would not be considered an arrest. And then that child would then um, be required to do some community service. They had to write an essay. There were some other things to sort of right that wrong, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't an arrest on their record, right? Um, so, you know, that to me was a, a huge step to try to intervene early on so that our young people didn't get caught up you know, in, in the system. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who even sort of frown on our work because they feel like where well, you're coming in after the fact 
and you should be more proactive before the fact in a preventative nature. Um, and, and to that, I say there's some validity to that, but also, you know, I was always taught my first job out of college was sales, right? And I was always taught in sales. You can't sell anything until you get somebody's attention. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's that arrest that now has a person's attention where you can now redirect that behavior, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think there's just two sides to that coin. Um, I think things like the civil citation program uh, should be widely adopted and should um, be really robustly established with with programming and, and things to help um, young people understand the, the circumstances of which they're dealing with. You know, I, I personally, when I was when I was 14 years old, um, <laughs> I did something really silly. Um, I, I had an older friend who had a car and I convinced him to let me drive his car. Well, he obliged as long as I promised to bring him something back from the store. But within five minutes, I had wrapped his car around a tree because oh. I didn't have any license, um, had never really driven solo before. Um, right. and so I found myself with like eight different charges, um, driving without a license, failure to maintain your lane, striking a fixed object, all this stuff, right? Um, but I never got arrested. They put me in the back of the police car and they took me home. Now, that was the worst part of it all, to be frank with you, was, you know, answering right. mom and daddy. <laughs> um, but I did have to go before a judge. And that judge required me to write a 2,000-word essay on what it means to make good decisions. That essay changed my life because it taught me that you have to count the costs before you make every decision in life. And you have to not only count the costs and understand what are the effects on me personally, but what are the effects on other people? Here it is. I've totaled this young man's car. I've created a hardship for this family mm -hmm. all because of my selfish desire to be cool and drive somebody's car. Now, right. my wife, who I think is on um, listening to this, she will probably tell you that what it really made me was anal retentive <laughs> um, because I think about everything and process everything before I do it. Um, but what I would say to that is that's not all bad to just take a step back and discount the cost. Um, and so the judge said, you know, when I read this essay, if I yawn, you'll never get your driver's license. If I get bored, you'll never get your driver's license. And so it had to be a really engaging, um, engaging essay. So I've been driving for 30 years now, so I did get my license. Um, but again, that was just a life-changing moment for me, which could have gone either way. You know, I mean, they could have, I could have gotten caught up in the system. Um, but there are some other alternatives by which you can reach individuals. And I think more things like that are, are just warranted and needed in our society today. Right, because I think like having somebody like that judge as well, who is, well, first of all, directly invested in your betterment. Um, secondly, not just asking you to do something because he wants you to do something, but actually having you do the work, put in the work and recognize the value of that work. I like right. that, that prompt. If I yawn at all, when reading this essay, you're not going to get your license. That's, you know, that puts a little bit of pressure on whoever it is that's, I'd feel the pressure if oh, I was yeah. writing that at 36 years. Yeah, so that's, that's really neat. I, I, the um, civil citation program that you were talking about, that is in effect in Hillsborough County, right? It is in effect, and it's uh, okay. countywide now in Hillsborough County. Um, I think somebody mentioned support on one of the comments, and they're absolutely right. I did have the family support, which also made mm -hmm. a difference. Um, I think in that situation as well, I think, you know, it didn't take long for um, the judge to realize that I really feared my dad more than I feared <laughs> the judge. <Right. laughs> um, so that family support uh, was certainly important. Heard, heard. Um, I also know that previously had mentioned that a brand ministry is that your core focus is um, also prison ministry services. And right. so um, through all of this work, right, how does your, how does your faith as well as, you know, the humans who work with you in your organization at large, how does faith in general inform the work that you do? So, you know, our, our organization was founded by um, Abraham Robert Brown, who um, was a, an educator 
for 38 plus years in Hillsborough County. Um, he's affectionately known in the community and remembered in the community as coach. But he also um, became a pastor um, of a church and entered um, the pastorate. So, you know, he was a follower of Christ, um, obviously. Um, the ministry was established on biblical principles. And, um, you know, I spent 10 years in corporate America before I came here, and I was actually, you know, led away from corporate America by my belief and by my faith. And to this day, that continues to motivate me to do the work that we do. I mean, it really is about love and redemption for the least of these in our community. So um, that remains uh, an important part of what we do. Not all of our staff members um, are Christians, um, and, and that's okay. Um, but for those who are, many of them will tell you that they too are motivated motivated and, and driven by their faith as well. So uh, we are a faith-based, remain a faith-based organization. Heard, heard. Um, so I want to switch up the conversation a little bit, right? Um, the reason that we created, that we started creating space um, was to invite people who were doing work in our community, but especially who were doing work in our community around marginalized folks um, to, rev to talk about discrimination that reveals itself during a time like a global crisis, right? And we're living in very different times now. Um, sure. So many people are still working from home. Um, phase one has just been completed. We don't, we're seeing statistics coming out of uh, various offices on what that has meant for many people in many communities. Um, mm -hmm. And people are still, you know, everyone's still very much holding back in terms of stepping outside and interacting with other folks. There are some reports that have said physical distancing um, and the wearing of masks, so on and so forth, will go on until 2022. Um, until we have a viable vaccine, until everybody can receive it, so on and so forth, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of change that's happened very quickly, and there are some reports that are coming out of um, activist groups about prisons and what safety and preventative methods look like for inmates during the time of COVID nineteen. In right. recent in, in in the past week or so, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, um, many prisoners have many prison systems have also released inmates um, to prevent overcrowding and to prevent that kind of close contact. But overall, um, do you know what is happening in the prison system as far as taking care of inmates and keeping them safe currently? So first of all, I think um, in all fairness to any prison system, Florida Department of Corrections, uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, no matter where you are. That is a very challenging environment to maintain social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, folks are in confined quarters. Um, there's a lot of people and really there's no independent movement. Everything is based on a controlled movement. So um, they have a huge, huge task before them in order to establish a protocol that, that makes sense. So um, with that, though, um, I've been reading and I've been keeping up because there's an impact on us because we don't have access to the prisons right now. And so we have three of our major programs that – are contingent upon our ability to go into the prisons um, and meet with those who are incarcerated. And so all of that has been, you know, brought to a screeching halt. So um, with that, what they are doing is they're limiting movement. Um, they aren't allowing um, individuals to um, gather in common areas, as I understand it, um, and then those who have tested positive, um, to the best of their ability, what they're trying to do is to get them in the medical quarantine, but there's not enough beds there um, in those mm -hmm. instances. Um, and so really what you have to sort of do is start looking at the numbers and perhaps um, transport, uh, and they've done some of this, moving people out of institutions 
that have been hit real hard and kind of creating, you know, these institutions that are considered kind of quarantine mm-hmm. institutions, if you will. Um, so it, it, it really is a challenge for them. I mean, I can't imagine how daunting that is, um, not right. just for those who are incarcerated, but even for the officers. I mean, the officers are coming and going. Um, and so they're going back to their respective community and then they're going to work the next day. Um, everybody, um, is, you know, in mass now. Um, so I think, you know, that certainly is helpful. Um, but as you stated, Sam, I don't think until there is a proven vaccine that is readily available, um, that we will be able to go back into the prisons in the manner that we have. So we're going to have to really push um, the technology piece. And and I think that's going to be for two reasons. One, I don't think they want us in there, not right. necessarily knowing. And two, I'm probably going to be hard pressed to convince folks to go in <laughs> for sure. um, without, um, without a vaccination. So that certainly creates a challenge. But even in the community, if you take that same thought, um, obviously we don't have multiple prisons, but what we do have is we have five transition homes where up to five men um, reside in these homes as they come out of prison while they go through the Ready for Work Hillsboro program. Um, those are just the homes that we have, but we have other transitional living home partners whom we partner with um, who do the similar work as, as far as providing a, a safe haven um, for these individuals. And so um, right now we have 14 men in our five homes. So we are under the same sort of pressure, if you will, um, of how do we maintain the safety of these individuals in these homes? What if one person in this home is, you know, positive for COVID-19? What does that mean for the other four um, who may reside in that home with them? Um, right. we, we, in the evenings, as part of our transitional living program, um, there were some group sessions. We've stopped all of those group sessions as far as bringing folks together in that vein. Um, so it, it really is a challenge, um, even at the smallest level. So what we did is we had all of our transitional living program uh, re- residents go get tested. They got test, tested, and thank God all of them tested negatively. Um, but we had a strategy in place. We had designated, okay, this home is going to be the quarantine home. You know, this home, as people coming out of prison and we don't know their status, this is going to be sort of that first 14-day home until we can sort through, you know, their situation. Um, it, it It's it's a challenge. It, it just is. You get somebody coming out of prison, and this actually happened two Saturdays ago. We were doing some work. Um, we had a roof leak, so we did sort of this volunteer project to coat the roof. And um, it was on a Saturday, and when I pulled up, there's a guy hanging out right outside our door. And I introduced myself, and he introduced himself, and he said, um, I just got released from Blackwater Correctional Institution. Well, Blackwater was one of the first prisons that had a COVID-19 breakout outbreak wow. right and so here right. he is and we didn't we weren't expecting him right and so you know it's like okay well what do you do you know um he doesn't know his status he wasn't tested he doesn't know his status you don't want to introduce you know you don't want to introduce the infection perhaps into a safe environment um so what do you do with this individual and when you think about the testing, the testing is very critical in all of this, but if this individual has to wait a week, 14 days for test results, what do you do with them in the interim? I mean, where is he going to wait? Exactly. I mean, he's basically in a a homeless situation, um, if you will. So, I mean, there's some real challenges there across the board um, that are very practical that we have to work through. Um, But I will say this, our staff has been amazing. Um, we, we never closed our doors. Uh, we did work remotely, but we never closed our doors. We never stopped serving our clients throughout this whole thing. And I, I just have to give a shout out to our staff for their, their resiliency and their hard work and continue. I mean, we're all in the office today, um, serving, serving clients. So, um, even in those very sensitive situations, um, I mean, we have a team that's really committed to the cause, uh, but, but the struggle is real. Um, you know, there's this theory of, well, why don't you just release 
these folks so that you can help the situation in the prison. Um, I was going to ask you that. I mean, that's a novel thought. But again, based on the situation that I just described, it's right. not as easy as it comes across. Yeah, you release them, but is the community prepared to be able to provide, you know, the care and the essentials of life that this individual needs? Or are you releasing this person into a situation that, you know, um, perhaps can be described as somewhat hopeless for them? Because now what do I do? Where do I go? Um, right. So it's not quite as simple as it seems. I mean, release them. Yeah, just release them all. That's one thing. But then what are you going to do when they show up in the community? And you have to be able to, again, going back to, you know, is it the criminal justice system or is it society? It's both. Society has to be prepared um, as well. Right. Yeah, so I see what you're saying with, because um, initially the, the has all, there's been a lot of talk about this early release plan, right? But then it uh, makes you wonder, are any of those early releases to reduce the overcrowding in the prisons just a way to wash your hands off a bunch of people so that you don't have to deal with it? Or is it actually a solution that mm -hmm. can work? But again, what, what are we sending these humans into if they don't have any support, if they don't have a place to live, if they don't have food for a substantial amount of time until they can get back on their feet? There right. are people up or people who are un not incarcerated are already losing their jobs. You know, jo the job market is not open by any means, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what about the families of humans who are incarcerated? Are they worried about COVID-19? They, they are worried. Um, oh, their family? They are worried. Um, before I get to that, though, another true story. When um, Sheriff Chronister, when he released that first group of um, individuals just from the county jail, there mm -hmm. was a young lady who had nowhere to go. Um, as I understand it, she begged them not to release her because she was going to be homeless because she didn't have any kind of support system. And so right. she begged to stay, you know, just let me stay in jail, put me back in jail. Um, but we actually ended up serving that young lady because um, she was on that, on the front end of things. Um, and we continue to serve her and are in that, that portion of the program where we're trying to help her get a job. Um, but to your question about the families, yes, families are very worried. Um, we have a program here called the Family Reunification Video Visitation Program where families can come to our offices here in East Tampa and they can visit um, with their incarcerated parents live via video um, on Monday afternoons. Um, and we have that program in four prisons right now, um, Polk Correctional, Hernando Correctional, Lowell Correctional, and Sumter Correctional Institution. However, when the movement stopped within the prisons, they wouldn't allow these parents to come for the video visits. So now, you know, even though you have the caregiver and the children here in the community um, willing to come to our office still, um, and we're socially distanced and masked up, wanting to visit with their incarcerated parent, they, they can't because there's no movement within the institution as part of their strategy to minimize the COVID spread. Um, so families, families are worried. Um, one of the things I will say, which is an option, and this is something that we're going to be exploring with the children's board here, and that is um, a, about a year or so ago, the department finally embraced technology to a certain degree, and inmates can purchase uh, what they call JPay tablets, and they okay. can visit uh, with their incarcerated loved ones um, via that tablet. They can either do videograms, um, they can do email, and then there's a kiosk um, in the dormitories where they can uh, schedule a, a live video visit as well. Um, so that option is there, and to the department's credit, um, they gave you have to do that using digital stamps. So there's a cost associated with it. So obviously you got to buy the tablet and then there's these, there are these digital stamps. I think, you know, you can do a, a 15 minute visit for 39 cents or something like that. Um, but what they did was when they suspended visitation and limited the movement, um, the department actually um, 
allocated a certain amount of free digital stamps to those who are incarcerated okay. so that they could maintain that contact that contact with their family. Um, so, you know, there have been some steps that have been made to help kind of ease the pain through this. Um, but there are some some worried families, especially in those institutions that have very, very high numbers of uh, of COVID-19 spreading. And honestly, right. you know, the numbers are the numbers, but I just can't help but imagine that, you know, that spread is probably a little worse than what, what we may know. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking the same thing when I saw those numbers, for sure. Um, Marcel is saying, this conversation is giving me so much to think about, so much nuance. Very accurate, very accurate. Um, another quick question for you. Will you all be planning on doing more video works to, in order to be able to get into the prisons? So we are negotiating with the prisons, actually, um, in that regard, <laughs> because, like I said, we have to push the use of technology. Um, but that is very awkward and very different for the department, because obviously maintaining security um, is important to them. So right. what we're trying to do now is to see if uh, Abraham Ministries organizationally can establish uh, a JPay account where um, we would be able to communicate with, for starters, those individuals that are preparing to come out of prison, come back to Hillsborough County, and get them going on the intake process for the Ready for Work Hillsborough program. Um, we're we're just now kind of having those conversations. It's it's very fresh for the department because it's not something that they would typically do um, just the family reunification program alone we had to purchase all of the equipment at one point we had to pay for the broadband line to be established to be established inside the prison um, just so that we could do these visits it wasn't something that the department was going to foot the bill for um, right. at all so um, now in this instance um, you know I'm just I'm just not sure setting up the account is one thing I'm not sure that all of the, um, I hate using this word, but all of those who are incarcerated, I'll do it, say it that way, that all right. of those who are incarcerated um, have the JPay tablets. Um, so, you know, could we find a philanthropic donor in the community who might be willing to, um, you know, fund the purchase of a tablet for an indigent uh, individual that's incarcerated just so that they can perhaps have access to their family? Um, but also have access to the ministry to begin sort of that programming component for uh, their soon to be release. So those conversations are, are being had. But, yeah, we have to push the ledger of technology um, within the prisons. And there's a way to do it securely. I think the institutions are kind of figuring that out through their JPay system. Heard, heard. I don't know um, how comfortable you are answering this question, so just – Please let me know if it's not within uh, your comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. What has been your experience so far working with the prison system? Um, I think, you know, the, the system has really, um, they're really entrenched in, 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 in their ways. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that because when this ministry was founded in 1977, 1976, mm -hmm. there were only 17 state prisons, right? People were going to prison for the first time. Today, you know, there's more than 130, 135 correctional institutions in the state of Florida. So in 40 years, we've gone from 17 to 135 correctional institutions. Um, we've gone from, you know, uh, having a few thousand people incarcerated to just under 100,000 people incarcerated in the state of Florida. And so um, needless to say, like I said, we didn't get that way overnight. Um, and people are not necessarily going to prison for the first time. They're going to prison, you know, for second, third, fourth time. So um, my experience has been that um, change within the prisons is very slow. Um, you know, int their focus is care, custody, control. I mean, if you talk to any of them, they can rattle that out off, you know, those three C's, care, custody, control. That's our responsibility. You know, nothing more, nothing less to maintain care, custody, control. Um, but at some point, 
you have to turn the corner from just care custody control to correction and rehabilitation. Um, and so I think, you know, the department for the last, I don't know, probably decade um, has really been, been, been wrestling with what, what does that rehabilitation look like in the institutions? Um, you know, what does that look like from a financial obligation um, as well? Because this has been a dollar strapped, you know, uh, organization for many years, you know, un underfunded for various reasons. Um, so they don't always have the resources necessary. Um, so that presents challenges for them as well. Um, but the other piece that has to be overcome is just the culture. I mean, that that prison culture um, must change. I had an opportunity um, to to serve on uh, Governor Jeb Bush's uh, his ex offender task force that he created. I actually ended up vice chairing that. And one of the recommendations that we made was for the department to expand their faith and character based institutions. Now, some maybe felt like we were motivated because it was faith, but it really had nothing to do with faith. It really had everything to do with the environment and the culture within those particular institutions. That's what we really wanted replicated because right. within those institutions, there was mutual respect. Um, the people were treated with dignity and not mm -hmm. only so, the um, individuals who were incarcerated in those institutions, they too were of like mind because, you know, they didn't have the disciplinary reports. They weren't with, you know, all of the foolishness that takes place in prison. They were really focused on um, getting better and being better. And so when you, when you put those like-minded individuals in the same institution, and combine that with staff members who who get it um, and can give that mutual respect, it was like a night and day difference when you went into those institutions versus other institutions. And so it really was about expanding that culture um, within the system um, that we were after. So that was one piece of it. And then the other piece of it um, is that reentry should begin upon entry. I mean, the system does a great job of processing people into the prisons, um, but they didn't at that time do very much of anything to help transition them out of the prisons. And so um, out of that, um, there are four regions, and now they have a what they call a transition center in each one of those four regions um, where individuals who are short on their time within, you know, say, 36 months of release um, for us – our transition center is Polk Correctional Institution, which is about 45 minute drive east of here. Um, mm -hmm. Those individuals who are returning to Hillsborough County, Polk County, Pasco County, or Pinellas County um, are supposed to transition through Polk Correctional Institution where they will provide um, intense services to ready them for entering back into the, com in into the community. Um, okay. And so, you know, that was a step in the in the right direction. Um, but I would also tell you this, what what in working with the department, one of the challenges is continuity of leadership. I think, you know, in the 20 years that I've been with A. Brown Ministries, um, man, I must have seen 16, 17 uh, secretaries of Department of Corrections. So when there's no continuity at the top, it it really is hard to lead change. Um, so the current secretary, Secretary Inch, I think is doing a phenomenal job. Um, he's done some things that I've never seen a secretary do. Um, he's written personal letters to all of uh, the men and women who are incarcerated in prison, um, even before the COVID-19 piece, um, just making a declaration to them um, about the changes that they should see, will see, and if they don't see, let me know uh, within the institution. Um, he's also done the same thing from a COVID-19 standpoint, um, but I've never seen a secretary 
communicating directly to the men and women that are incarcerated in those institutions um, and establishing, trying to earn their trust, if you will. So I, I think, you know, the trajectory, you know, is looks pretty good. Um, the funding challenge we'll see because after COVID-19, you know, if the governor guts the budget and the department doesn't get all the funds that they need to address mm -hmm. some of the, the serious issues that they have, um, you know, that, that, that could hurt as well. Organizations like ours, I mean, we stand to get our funding cut. Our Ready for Work Hillsboro program is funded 95% through the state of Florida um, through an appropriation. You know, if our funds get cut, then again, you go back to that investment in the community. Um, and where does that investment come? And, and Sam, right. I'll just tell you, it's, it's hard to raise money for this population, right? Um, mm -hmm. I've been I've been watching the uh, on Netflix during my quarantine these uh, uh, we all? <laughs> the Innocence Files um, from the Innocence Project, and they do some amazing work. And some of these cases are awesome, um, and we rally behind that around that, and we should. Um, but who will love the guilty? Right. Um, right. We serve people who they did their crime, but at what point? You know, am I forgiven? At what point do I have an opportunity of redemption? Um, right. And so it's just not it's not sexy, if you will, to raise money and to make donations to an organization that serves ex-convicts. Right? Um, right. So raising money for this organization is, is very difficult and we can't do it all through the government. Um, and, and I get that. But we um, we just have to continue to try to identify you know, generous people in the community who have ways and means who can get behind this work and who get it. And we can combine that with things like our state appropriation and do some amazing, amazing work. So, you know, we started this letter writing campaign to the governor, you know, asking him not to veto um, our, our dollars and our ask um, so that we can continue this work because now more than ever, you know, we have new individuals who are coming out of prison um, and individuals who are currently in the program who are losing their jobs and with, you know, the unemployment rate being what it is right now, that competition is going to be steep. And yep. so we really have to um, work feverishly on behalf of, of those we serve to, to get them placed, get them equipped first and then get them placed. I love that. That there's so much, um, I feel like there's so much, I've learned so much in having this conversation with you. There's so much clarity in terms of how um, the prison system works, how we need to see change from there, but also society as well needs to become better equipped to um, welcome returning citizens back to society and be able to provide for them what it is that they need um, when they return from that prison system, as well as the idea that humanity is not black and white. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we have to figure out, like you said, it's a population that is hard to fundraise for because humanity is not black and white. And we have to factor ourselves. We always factor ourselves into it when it comes to something that is cause based. When we think about who we will and will not support, how mm -hmm. and how we cannot support. Why are we supporting this population, but that, not that population, right? We have to question our own humanity in order mm -hmm. to be able to understand somebody else's. So thank you so much for that. Um, um, Susan Lee is asking us, how much are the tablets? Uh, the tablets, there, there, there are two versions of the tablet. I think there's a $65 version of the tablet, and then there's like $120 for a little bit larger screen. Okay. So um, would you like to go ahead and tell us, Robert, how, as for the people who are watching and for the people who will watch this recording, how can we uh, how can we support a brand ministries? How can we support the work you are doing? How can we support incarcerated humans? How can we support returning humans? Um, what What are your words of advice for us? Well, I think um, you know the the first piece is sort of in the spirit of community of Tampa Bay, and that is um, to to show love and accept people um, for who they are, right? Um, to to refrain from placing judgment uh, based on the situation and the circumstances, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, obviously, you know, any 
organization, a nonprofit organization, especially grassroots community organization, you know, needs resources, um, needs funding. But I think our greatest resource is human capital. I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, one way that the community can help is through um, life coaching and help individuals to, I mean, it's similar to mentoring. We call them life coaches, but we try to partner our, our clients with someone who can help them navigate through this thing called life, right? We call this work reentry, but it's really not re anything. It's really starting right. from square one um, and helping people to navigate through. Um, so, you know, we always need life coaches who, you know, we will train about the do's and the don'ts because, you know, their manipulation is a common, um, you know, method of behavior uh, for the population that we serve. So there's some things that you want to do to guard yourself. Um, but to to train individuals to come alongside and help um, our in, our population get to where um, they want to be in life. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, right now, I'm just thinking, you know, we have these five homes, right? And it's imperative that we maintain the cleanliness, make sure that these homes are sanitized, et cetera. Um, but realize this, when I go to Walmart, just because I go in and say that I'm purchasing for eight Brown Ministries, I still only get one. <laughs> All right. right. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. so, um, when it comes to disinfectants and cleaning supplies and that kind of thing, we really need an inventory so that we can keep our home sanitized and clean. Um, and just purchasing one at a time doesn't work. And, you know, they don't see us in the same vein as, um, you know, uh, a hospital or a nursing home and that kind of thing, um, even though we are considered essential service. But, you know, if there are donations of uh, disinfectants, um, cleaning supplies, et cetera, um, we welcome those as well. And again, I mean, financial gifts, we've always been a good steward. Even in this time of COVID, we completed our 2019 um, annual audit remotely, if you can yes. imagine that. So we've been pulling files and, you know, doing all this stuff. And we just got um, another um, unqualified audit. So we're good stewards with all of those things. People can visit our website, too, to learn about other ways they can get involved at um, www.abrown.org. So um, if y'all look in the chat, Sammy has posted it in the chat, abrown.org. Um, yeah. So y'all can visit their website. Sorry, please go. Ahead. No, sure. Um, and find out more information and more ways to get involved there. Um, you know, I, I appreciate opportunities like this. It gives us a voice. It gives us an opportunity to, you know, help increase awareness, to um, help educate the community um, about this population. And so I want to thank you personally for the invitation and allowing me to share here today. Course. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have about 10 seconds left, so I don't want us to get cut off, but I do want to say thank you so much, Robert. Hope thank you have you. a wonderful day. Thank you.